we're going to continue talking about DIG, which is a series that we started with last week. And it's really discussing the four wells that we must be vigilant to keep open and dig open over and over again so that they don't get closed up. And those four wells are the well of discipleship, the well of intimacy, the well of the gospel of grace, the well of the gifts of the anointing and the Holy Spirit. And as a church, we desire to see every single person being fruitful in their lives. And how many of us know that to be fruitful, we need water? We need the water and we need the living water of Jesus to be flowing in and out of us if we want our lives to be fruitful. Last week, Wolfie started the series and he started with the I instead of the D. He started with I, which is the well of intimacy. So if you've missed that, please listen to it online. It was an amazing service. But today, I'm going to be talking about D, which is the well of discipleship, which Dan has already said. And I want to talk about discipleship, but before I can talk about it, I need to say what discipleship is. And I know there are gazillion definitions out there, but I want to give you my definition of what discipleship is. And my definition of discipleship is one who has answered the call to follow Jesus and who is on a journey actively growing to become like him, being transformed. It's also one who is making other disciples by sharing who Jesus is, helping them to follow Jesus as they are still doing, and encouraging them to do the same with others. Now that's my simple definition of discipleship. If you want a real breakdown of what that looks like and what that means, join us on our teaching nights on Monday nights. You can tell Wolfie's rubbed off on me. Join us on our teaching nights that will be starting back up again in a few weeks. So discipleship. I really want to focus on one main aspect of what that is today. Being a disciple of Jesus is a long, exciting, and sometimes very challenging journey. It's a journey you will be on your whole life. You never arrive. You just keep going and going and going. It's a journey that should change your life, and it's a journey that should change the life of many others because it's changed your life. And to give you an example of that, I want us to watch a short little video before I continue to see what that looks like. This is Nate. Nate became a Christ follower two weeks ago and is still a bit giddy about it. Now he's trying not to do cartwheels in public. Nate became a believer partly because of... Kim. Yet oddly enough, Kim and Nate have never met. Now is this possible? Well, let's take a look. Kim loved Jesus from an early age, and in college she had a huge impact on her friends. While most of her peers used their college years to, well, experiment, Kim didn't. She remained committed to her faith, and it showed. It especially showed to Lisa, her roommate, who confessed to Kim that she wanted whatever it was that made Kim so strong. Kim shared her faith with Lisa, and Lisa believed. Years later, at Lisa's first real job, she met Thomas. Thomas was hit by a drunk driver when he was 13 and still carried a lot of anger and bitterness. Thomas and Lisa became friends, and it wasn't long before he started going to church with Lisa and her husband. After a lot of studying and searching, Thomas gave his life to Christ. Fast forward a few years. Thomas became a public speaker and was often asked to speak at large events. See, when he became a believer, Thomas developed a new perspective on life. He stopped resenting what had been taken from him and started being thankful for the second chance he had been given. On one particular day, Thomas shared about overcoming hardship and what it means to choose joy. He was so passionate that a number of people were inspired to share a link to his video. The video of Thomas inspired James, too. And if anyone needed inspiration, it was him. James had a ton of issues. He spent most of his life as a passive husband, an absent father, and a horrible friend. That said, no one disliked him more than he disliked himself. But everything changed the night he happened to watch Thomas online. Something clicked and he knew what he had to do. He surrendered his miserable life to someone greater, 
and he was forever changed. James fought hard to make up for the lost years with his family. And he also began working with young men who were in danger of throwing their lives away. One of those men was Nate. Nate didn't really know his own dad, and he had no real direction in life, ultimately bouncing from one bad decision to another. Because of that, he often found himself in trouble with the law. No one had ever showed him what it looked like to be a real man. That is, until he met James. James became the first father figure Nate ever had. He learned about honesty, self-control, humility, and integrity, and where those traits come from. Two months later, Nate publicly declared his belief in Christ. And of course, James was there. Now you can see the connection. Nate was impacted by James, who was influenced by Thomas. Thomas saw an uncommon joy in Lisa, who learned of Jesus from Kim. Kim's relationship with God eventually led to Nate's. Funny how these two people have never met and never will. It's amazing, isn't it? Some of you are thinking, I was one of those people that somebody shared Jesus with and there. But then some of you are thinking, my Christian walk with God could never and has never touched someone's life or affected someone's life. Hold that thought. Stay with me. The book of Acts and chapter 2 talks about a disciple named Peter, who's also called Simon, who stands up boldly, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and addresses a massive crowd of people and begins to tell them the truth about Jesus. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read things like this in the Bible, when I hear about this disciple who did such amazing things, I think I could never be qualified to do something like that. I could never be a disciple that does something like that. I love Jesus, but my journey with him could never make a difference in someone's life. And today, I want to concentrate, I want to focus on this man Peter's life, a follower, a disciple of Jesus. And I want to focus on him because I really believe that he's a true representation of what a disciple's journey looks like, which is this. This is what a disciple's journey actually really looks like. It's not this. And a lot of people think that it's supposed to look like this. And because they think that it's supposed to look like this, they start their journey and then some dirt comes into their well and they think that's it. My line has gone down. I'm disqualified. It's not worth it. I'll never succeed. I can't be a disciple. And they don't continue. And they live a life with no life, no fruit. Peter was one of the men that Jesus spoke to when he said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He was a fisherman. He began to follow Jesus, not knowing anything about what it meant to follow Jesus. He began to spend time with him. He began to listen to him. He began to talk to him. And little by little, his life began to change from the inside out. But I say little by little. It was not a quick process. It was a very long process. Many times in Peter's life, it looked like he would take a step forward and then take one or two steps back. A step forward and then two or three steps back. That was Peter's life. It was that squiggly line that we just saw up there. It wasn't a quick process. Can anybody relate? I feel like you take one step forward and a few steps back. I want to share a few examples of Peter's journey with you of following Jesus, because I think that we can relate to him. And two of those examples, or the first two, are walking on the water, sort of, and Peter rebukes Jesus. So the first one, it says in Matthew 14, 28, 31, it says, Jesus was walking on the water, and Peter saw him. And Peter cries out and says, Jesus, if it's you, 
tell me to come to you. And Jesus says, come. And so Peter gets out of the boat and he starts walking. But all of a sudden he sees the wind and the waves. And he's distracted and he begins to sink. The wind and waves are examples of the distractions of this world. Have you ever felt like you heard from God? You step out of the boat and you begin walking and all of a sudden the distractions of the world start coming around you. And sometimes for a lot of us, those distractions are our own thoughts. You've missed it. I actually sent an email out to someone two weeks ago feeling like, I know that God told me to send this email to encourage them. I stepped out of the boat. I was sharing with Dina the other day. I've been fighting with this, this point right here for the past two weeks. I sent this email encouraging someone, and in two weeks I haven't heard from them. But you know what? I, I've had to keep digging the doubts away and telling myself, this person's not good with emails, so they might not have even read it. Um, and they have a lot going on in their life right now. So just because they haven't got back to me doesn't mean that I've missed it. I've been shoveling the doubt back out, the distractions back out. Peter cried out to Jesus, and Jesus helped him to get back into the boat. Yes, he said, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? But Peter followed Jesus onto the water. He got distracted by his surroundings. Jesus didn't let him drown. When he cried out, Jesus, help me, Jesus took his hand, and he pulled him back in the boat. In our journey of following Jesus, we will take steps of faith, and sometimes we will see God do amazing things. But sometimes we're going to get distracted. Sometimes we will doubt, and we will begin to sink. But we need to cry out, Jesus, help me! And he will stick out his hand, and he'll pull you back in the boat. The second one is Jesus rebuked, I'm oh, sorry, re Peter rebuked Jesus. Jesus rebukes later. Peter rebuked Jesus. And we see that in Matthew 16, 22, 23. And the few verses before that, Peter had just declared that Jesus was the Christ. But then Jesus begins to share with his disciples and to tell them, I'm going to die on the cross I have to go and die on the cross. I'm going to die a horrible death, but I will be raised in three days. When Jesus is saying this, Peter says, wait, 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 wait. And he pulls him to the side and he says, Jesus, you shouldn't say things like that. You shouldn't be thinking like that. And at that point, Jesus rebukes Peter. And he says, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. In Matthew 16, 23, Peter was still thinking like the world. He was still thinking like the enemy, and he spoke like the enemy. Peter was not setting his mind on the things of God, the things, um, his ways, God's plans, his purposes. Instead, he still had his mind on the things of man, the things of the world and its earthly values. Peter's way of thinking needed to be transformed. Being or becoming a disciple is about transformation. And it takes place in us by where things that are not Christ-like begin to be stripped off. They begin to be dug away, if we can say. We have to constantly redig the well of discipleship in our life to keep being transformed into the image of Christ, to keep having our minds being renewed like Christ the way that he wants us to think, the way that he wants us to be, the way that he wants us to speak. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We need our minds to be transformed. The third example that I want to use of Peter is that after spending three years with Jesus and even telling him, I'll stick with you to the end, he denies him three times. And I'd like Dan to read that for me, where he denies him three times. Then, seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. 
Peter followed at a distance. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, other scriptures say he even cursed and swore, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. You know, the message version and verse 59 says, about an hour later, someone else spoke up, really adamant. He's got to have been with him. He's got Galilean written all over him. Who do you have written all over you? Who do you have written all over you? When people look at you, can they see that you've been with Jesus? Can they say, they look different. They sound different to me. Or have you got a place to a place in your journey that people can see that you've been with Jesus, but you've blown it? Can I tell you something? Jesus knows we're going to blow it. He knows that we're not perfect. And the proof of this is in Peter's life. That even before he denied Jesus three times, it says in Luke 22, 31 to 32, Peter, Peter, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. I love it. Jesus was praying for him. He says, when you have turned back, when you dig that well out again, go and strengthen your brothers. You aren't walking alone on this journey. You're not following Jesus alone and by yourself. He's praying for you. And he sent the Holy Spirit to help you. If you take a step back, he's going to encourage you to take a step forward. Peter was a disciple of Jesus. He followed him. He learned from him. He imitated him. He told others about him, and they became followers of Jesus. People were healed, saved, set free. But Peter was human, which means he wasn't perfect. His journey was exactly that, a journey. With smooth, it wasn't with smooth and bumpy roads. It was the squiggly line. His walk on the water was not su successful. Rebuking Jesus was definitely not a good thing. And he denied him three times. And I think we can all relate to one of those instances. And if you look throughout the New Testament, you can see many more instances of Peter where he's taken a step forward and a few steps back. Now, I want to get serious for a moment, and I just want to say one thing, that for the few of you who might be thinking, phew, God does not expect me to be perfect, so no big deal if I'm not. That way of thinking is exactly what the enemy wants you to think. The Bible even talks about it in the book of Romans. It says that since we are saved by grace, should we just go on sinning? Can we just go on sinning? The answer to that over and over again with exclamation points after it is by no means. By no means. Thinking like that and living like that way will lead to a well completely covered over with no life, no water. One thing about Peter, though, who we can learn from, he kept digging every time his well was covered up. He kept digging. He kept following after Jesus. He pursued transformation as Jesus pursued him. He kept digging away at anything that led him to being conformed to what the world was. When you look at that squiggly line of Peter's life, and it's our life, it keeps turning back around and going up. 
The Bible says that Peter denied Jesus three times. Then it says he wept when he heard the rooster crow. He knew that he was wrong and he repented. He redug his well again. A few weeks after Jesus rose from the dead, he was walking on the beach and the disciples came back from a fishing trip. They came onto the shore and Jesus had actually cooked them breakfast. And they're sitting down and they're eating. And Jesus turns to Peter, focuses on him. And he asked Jesus, he asked Peter three times, do you love me? And three times Jesus says, yes, I love you, Lord. And Jesus says, feed or take care of my sheep. Peter was actually hurt the third time that Jesus asked him if he loved him. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Because usually when somebody asks you more than once the same question, it's because they don't believe you, isn't it? Those of you who have parents or those of you who've been a child, which is all of us, you know, you, you, the child is standing there and the parent comes in and says, did you write blue crayon all over the wall? And the child says, no. And the parent says, you have a blue crayon in your hand. Did you write in blue crayon all over the wall? They don't believe. But this was not Peter's case right here. This wasn't what Jesus was doing. I can see some parents' faces saying, I've done that very same thing with my child. This wasn't the case with Jesus. This wasn't why he was asking Peter more than once, do you love me? You see, before Jesus went to the cross, before Peter denied him three times, Peter was a leader. The other disciples followed him. He was bold. He was outspoken. But then he denied Jesus three times. Jesus wanted Peter to say out loud three times, I love you. Just like he denied him three times. Jesus wanted to reinstate him. And the word reinstate means to bring back into use, to restore to a previous position. He didn't want Peter to think that he could never be a leader again. Some of you, that's, that's for you today. You've messed up, maybe even more than once, and you don't think I can ever lead again. Jesus wants to reinstate you today to restore you to your previous position. Dig out that well. Jesus washes the dirt off Peter. He restores him. Maybe the dirt has made its way back into your well. Maybe you've allowed circumstances to cover up your journey of following Jesus. You've been conformed to the world around you more than being transformed by God's presence. You might say, my life is not provoking anyone to say, what's different about you? So what do we need to do? We need to start redigging our wells. We need to begin to follow Jesus again. We need to turn that line back up around and remember that he's praying for you. As you love Jesus and as you follow him, he will begin to transform you. Jesus not only reinstated Peter, he actually used him to share the gospel at Pentecost, and over 3,000 people were saved. As the disciples told the truth of Jesus, the truth was spread to larger and larger areas. It's been spread by disciples whose journey looks like the squiggly line. One day the truth, of salva the truth, the salvation of Jesus, will reach every single nation. For many of you, it's reached you here. And now it's your turn to tell the truth about Jesus to someone else. Each of you has one friend or a circle of friends or a family member that you can share the truth about Jesus with. You know, I showed you that video clip at the beginning of the service about a person's life that has been changed and how so many other people's lives have been changed as a result of it. You have no idea the difference that your life can make on someone else or has already made on someone else. Maybe you thought, oh, that video, that was just actors. That really doesn't happen today.
they just just doing that to try to make us feel bad or that's just actors that doesn't really happen well if you know me and you've heard me speak before you know I like to share real stories and I like to share stories of people that hopefully most of us know and I want to do that today in closing this is Natty and Adrian they've never met before but Adrian is a Christian today because of Natty you see Natty was an, a, a student at Imperial College and he didn't hide the fact that he loved God and he met a young lady by the name of Joe And they had lots of conversations. And eventually he convinced Joe to come to church here. And she came into the service and she was radically saved and changed. And you can read about her story, a bit of her story in Rice Brooks' book called God's Not Dead. Well, Joe began her journey, got so excited about it, and then met a student by the name of Anne Marie who was also on a journey, who needed a little bit of help. And she began to walk with Anne-Marie. And Anne-Marie met Naomi, who became her housemate. And she began to share her journey about Jesus with her. And then Naomi met Helen and shared Jesus with her and began to walk with her. And then Helen met Sarah and brought Sarah to me one day, and together, Helen and I began to walk with Sarah. And I just want to read a message that Sarah sent to me. She said, Dear Tracy, you prayed a prayer of faith with me over six years ago, and now I'm still moved and amazed by what God has done. I finished medical school with Helen four years ago, and since then I've had countless opportunities to witness and pray with patients. My, most importantly, God speaks into my life every day. I'm now happily married, and my husband and I thrive on a God-filled relationship and have started a group in our church for 16 to 19-year-olds. It terrifies me, but it's God's call, and we humbly follow. Through faith, I reconciled my eating disorder, learned to love myself, and start living. Thank you for being such a humble servant to Jesus for speaking boldly about accountability and for sharing your own stories with me to help me grow. God bless Sarah. The person that Sarah shared Jesus with was Adrian, who she married. It's amazing how the good news can spread. You have no idea how your life can affect someone else's. And there are so many stories I could have done that with in here. So many. And I can tell you, I've watched every single one of their lives except for Adrian, and they all have that squiggly line journey. <laughs> it's not been a smooth line. Following Christ is a process. It starts with surrendering, digging up, and washing off. As we dig, we will see overflow. As we dig, you will see overflow. Jesus is calling you to tell others. First, we need to get to know him. We need to love him. And know that the journey is not going to be perfect because we are not perfect. But we need to keep redigging and share the truth of Jesus along the journey and we need to watch and trust and believe and redig and watch and trust and believe and redig that well and see what he does. Let's stand. Some of you might have had in mind that straight line picture that I showed at the beginning that 
that's what discipleship is supposed to look like. And I haven't been doing a very good job at it. Um, I didn't consider myself to really be a disciple. I'm going to say it again. It's a journey. And it's going to look like the squiggly line. And it's okay. Peter's life went back and forth all the time. Even after Pentecost and he preached that huge message. You can read he takes a few steps back again. More than once. It's a journey. But it's a journey where we have to allow Jesus to fill us. We have to follow him. I just want to pray for us. If you felt like you've missed it, you've bombed, (laughs) my journey hasn't been going so well. Jesus wants to tell you I'm reinstating you. The slate is clean. I'm washing you off right now. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Father God, I lift up every single person here. I thank you, God, for restoration right now in the name of Jesus. Restoration in themselves of what they think of themselves and their journey. Restoration and just maybe even in relationships that they might have lost because they missed it or they bombed. Lord, I thank you that you restore their position of looking like you. That you help them to be an example of you. Lord, I pray for any person here that's never even begun the journey to follow you here today. I pray, Father God, that if they want to begin that journey with you today, that they would take a step out of the boat and at the end of the service that they would come up here to me or to Dan and say, I want to begin the journey. Father God, we thank you for calling us to be fishers of men. We ask for your anointing. Holy Spirit, we thank you for helping us. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.